Open world was, and still might be, the standard for video games. Over the past two decades, we've seen them rise to fame and dominate the single-player genre. From humble beginnings that resembled a bit more of a dumpster fire than a video game, to modern miracles that are basically treated as the second coming of Christ, open world games have changed a lot since their inception. And in an unprecedented change of fate, the last four years have seen open world games fall from grace in an incredible fashion. Now, this is a video that's close to my heart, as open world games are my favorite genre. Almost all my favorite games of all time are open world, and they hold a special place for me. The ability to lose yourself in this world that is perfectly tailored to the game you're playing is an unparalleled experience, and has created some of the most magical moments in my experience playing video games. But even I have had a really hard time enjoying open world games in the last few years. Today we're going to take a look at what went right, what went wrong, and how we, that's right, you and me, can save gaming forever. Oh, okay. Now first, let's clarify something for all the dummies out there. Don't, don't be offended, this is also for me. Open world games are defined as games utilizing the game mechanic of a virtual world that the player can explore and approach objectives in freely, as opposed to a world with more linear and structured gameplay. Essentially, it's a game where they take the training wheels off and they let you ride with the big boys. Now, just this concept is, in my opinion, perfectly embodying what makes video games incredible. And it's part of why open world games rose to such great heights. The true beauty of playing a video game comes when you are fully immersed in a world. And what better way to do so than by letting the player take the reins and have true control over where they go, what they do, and whether or not they decide to commit genocide in White Man's Merchant District. The difference between a movie and a video game is in the control and open world games take this to another level. Now, on the opposite end of things, the opposite of an open world game is a linear game. These are games like Uncharted, Ratchet and Clank, uh, The Last of Us. If you haven't guessed yet, linear means PlayStation exclusive. Now, linear games are the games where you're very much on wheels, like a Disney ride. You're escorted through the story, you get to explore and play around, but for the most part, it's a straightforward experience. Both linear games and open world games are fantastic, and they both serve a unique purpose. But the appeal of open world games quickly came to be seen by publishers as something that makes games lucrative, so they began to pop up all over the place. Now this was great for a while, but eventually something happened, and now many open world games are left sitting in our libraries largely unplayed, and when we do go to boot them up, they feel hollow and empty. Another important thing to note is the marriage between open world games and RPGs. It's kind of like Netflix anime reboots and being bad. While not every open world game is an RPG, almost all of them are, or at least have RPG elements. But we'll get more into that later. Over the course of a few months in the early 2000s, open world games suddenly went from being a background character to having the spotlight, a position they held until now. And the past 30 years have seen this epic rise and fall of a genre that was once loved. It's a story of underdogs and overdogs, cowboys and gangsters, Miami and the French. Now without further ado, let's take a deeper look at exactly how this happened. First, let's take a trip down memory lane. Now, depending on who you ask, some people will say the first open world game was Ultima 1, the first Age of Darkness. Now, Ultima 1 was released in 1981 for the good old fashioned Apple II. It was the perfect escape for nerds in the 80s who were afraid of rock and roll and wanted to make their D&D campaigns come to life. Now, don't get it twisted. I wanna make it very clear that Meraki in the 80s would have eaten this shit up. Ultima featured a rudimentary version of a free-roaming overworld map that mimicked the tabletop feel of the Dungeons & Dragons franchise. And it was revolutionary, yes, but it wasn't the first open-world game. While Ultima 1 might have been the first good open-world game, Taito's Western Gun, known here in the States more simply as Gunfight, was the first game where players could truly explore a virtual world. Released in 1975, it wasn't exactly a good game per se, but it had decent success and paved the way for more games down the line. One of the reasons I wanted to bring this up is that Western Gun is touted as the first video game with violence. So in a way, we can credit Taito with the downfall of Western society. Now, video games in the 80s were still in their early stages, but it was a very pivotal time. I know we've all probably had Gramps sit you down and lecture you about the great video game market crash of 83, which is a very real thing and a very weird thing. But Nintendo and Segi were busy laying the groundwork for what would be among the largest media genres in just a few years' time. Now, open world games progressed a bit in this decade, with one small studio putting out an indie game you might know by the name of Legend of Zelda, but the 80s were once again a decade dominated by linear or arcade games. 
Games like the fraternal Super Mario Brothers, the puzzling Tetris, and the new hot video game on the street, Duck Hunt. Thanks again, Taito. Now the reason there weren't a lot of good open world games in this era is twofold. They're very expensive, and they're very tricky to make. It's very important to note this fact because this pillar of open world games still stands true today. A good open world game feels expansive and free, but it also feels full. Full of NPCs, full of things to do, enemies and dynamic events to come across, but most importantly, it feels full of life. However, before we move on, let's take a pit stop to note one of the most important games that came out this decade, Miami Vice. Miami Vice was released in 86 as the video game version of the TV show by the same name, featuring James Sonny Crockett and Ricardo Tubbs, household names that went on for generations. The TV show was insanely popular and was heralded as paving the way for this new genre of television. If you're unfamiliar with the show, you might at least notice their vaporwave graphics or from various references made to the show over the years. The game was a bit less groundbreaking, but it served an important role in paving the way. Much like the show, the game was essentially focused on derailing drug shipments controlled by the antagonist. Except instead of this, it looked like this. And unlike the show, the game received about the same reviews that my friends give me. So why am I wasting your time explaining the first Miami Vice video game? It's a top-down, crime-focused game where you can explore a map in your car as you drive fast and feel cool. There are two characters, so there's two cars, and there's four shadows. Enter the 90s. For many, the decade embodies nostalgia itself, with countless groundbreaking and genre-defining shows, movies, and of course, video games. For the open world genre, this is when things started to heat up. First, let's talk about Nintendo. The 90s saw the entrance of two of their greatest games in their history, and two of the greatest games, period, at the time. Super Mario 64 and The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Now both of these games deserve their own video, as for many gamers, these were the games that got them into gaming in the first place. They were both technical and narrative masterpieces in their own respect, with worlds that were beginning to feel full of life. For the first time in history, open world games were starting to feel like they might be the future, something that was worth investing both time and resources into. Now the reason these games were such hits, and the reason that they hold up to this day, is because they felt full of life. And they did so in different ways. Super Mario 64, like all Mario games, gets its life from its world and its environment. The plot of these games is simple and repetitive, so the narrative focus is shifted instead onto your adventure through the world, and how Mario fits into the environment as he journeys along to save the princess. Super Mario 64 was the first game to transfer this magic into a large 3D open world, resulting in the simple magic of Mario games being elevated to another level. By giving an open world life, Super Mario 64 became the best-selling game for the Nintendo 64, and it sparked inspiration for development studios across the globe. Now one of those games that was inspired by Super Mario 64 was The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Ocarina of Time took Super Mario's success and increased the scale, improved the graphics, and added a narrative backdrop so innovative that the game still holds to this day. Something we can't say about most 90s titles. Gee, it sure is boring around here. My boy. Much like Super Mario, Ocarina of Time is a game about a hero saving a princess, which was kind of the theme for Nintendo at the time. But for Link, the story has much more depth with characters guiding your journey, success and failure along the way, interesting villages and people to meet and interact with, a beautiful coming of age story, and an aesthetic that isn't afraid to have a dark and grim side to it. This isn't even mentioning the theme of time travel, which is still heralded to this day as a great narrative driver. Now above all, Ocarina of Time taught us that an open world game can truly feel alive, like an alternate reality you can truly explore, a story you can progress through at your own pace. It perfectly embodied the magic that video games can offer when they're done correctly. But despite all this success, the Ocarina of Time, while successful, was the 20th best selling game of the 90s, selling a respectable but modest 7.2 million copies. For what it was, it was criminally underrated and underappreciated when it was released, though thankfully it has earned the credit it deserved over time, with a few games journalists still recognizing it as the best game they've ever played, or at least the greatest game in the 90s. Regardless of the sales numbers, the Ocarina of Time was the first truly incredible open world game, and it opened the world for a generation of childhood defining experiences. Now before we leave the 90s, I have to first take note of an important franchise that was slowly picking up steam. Grand Theft Auto was released in 97 as the bad boy on the block, a game infamously marked marketed as a violent, controversial shoot-'em-up. It was a simple, top-down open-world game, in many ways looking like it was a few steps back, rather than a game that would progress the industry or push the envelope for open-world games forward. Much like its predecessors, Miami Vice, and the true bad boy and harbinger of all things violent, Taito's Western Gun, 
Grand Theft Auto received mixed reviews on release, but thanks to genius marketing and the general allure that violent and controversial games had at the time, it was a financial success. In 1999, I was born, but more importantly, GTA 2 came out, which is in many ways more of the same. Critics again had mixed reviews, and the game did decently. No one could have predicted that in just two years, the franchise would change the way we play games forever. Y2K came and went, and the video game industry continued to grow. Following in the footsteps of the Ocarina of Time, games continued to get better and better. And then came Grand Theft Auto 3. Grand Theft Auto 3 broke free of the confines of the previous entries in the series, ripping the camera out of the sky and placing it behind your character like some witchcraft, adding an engaging storyline, and finally, for the first time in the series, achieving not just commercial success, but critical acclaim as well. Reviews after release resulted in a 97 on Metacritic, with critics raving about the sound, the graphics, not the controls, which kind of stank. In fact, they smelled pretty bad. But above all, critics raved about the open world. In GTA 3, you find yourself in Liberty City, a metropolis based on America's very own city so nice they named it twice. That's right, Ohio City, baby. No, the game's based in New York, the city I'm actually currently in. Now, using that raw power of the PS2 we all know and love, Rockstar's team of 23 people at DMA in Ireland set out with the goal of changing video games from a thing you played to a place you lived in. And they absolutely succeeded. The map of Liberty City was absolutely massive for the time, but it wasn't just the scale that caused the game to have so much success. The art team was dead set on creating a world that felt alive, and they spared no detail. The world was massive and carefully articulated to match the aesthetics of parts of New York areas, with an industrious section for Queens and Brooklyn, a commercialized Manhattan, and a suburban New Jersey area. And I know what you're thinking, of course the game would have been probably the best game of all time if they hadn't included New Jersey, but everybody makes mistakes. Ah oh, shit, here we go again. Worst place in the world. Now, one thing the team did that was incredible is they recorded over 8,000 lines of recorded dialogue, with some estimates being over 18,000. Now, this allowed NPCs to interact with you at every turn. The soundtrack was carefully crafted to play at the perfect times to immerse you in the world. Characters were animated with motion capture and voiced with extreme care to make the game feel lifelike and subtle, like a world that wasn't trying to draw too much attention to itself. The story was developed directly in line with the art design, with missions that each felt like their own short narrative, and with an overarching plot that tied everything together. The lead producer stated that the game was a cross between the aforementioned Super Mario 64 and the Ocarina of Time, with inspiration also coming from the movie Goodfellas. And just as the Ocarina of Time improved on Super Mario 64, GTA 3 improved on Ocarina. The result was a technical and narrative masterpiece that brought both the eye of the public and the eye of major game publishers to the concept of large, immersive, but lifelike open worlds. Clearly, these games were hard work, but the end product was so innovative and exciting and enticing that the potential for the first time in gaming history was finally being seen. Immediately after the release, open world games exploded, not just in the quantity of games being released, but also in the quality. With more money being poured into development paired with the absolute raw gaming power of a new generation of consoles, the genre was pushed suddenly into the spotlight and it didn't look like it was going anywhere. In the wake of GTA 3, Bethesda's Fallout and Elder Scrolls series expanded their horizon, becoming pillars of the open world genre in their own right, with Fallout 3, Fallout New Vegas, and Elder Scrolls Oblivion all taking the concept of vivacious open worlds to new heights with new fantastical backdrops. Assassin's Creed came in and covered the historical open world niche very well, and World of Warcraft combined GTA's life-filled world with its MMO predecessors like EQ to create another way for players to enjoy open worlds, both massively and multiplayer-ly. Yeah. Finally, thanks to a few hardworking studios, games in the 2000s truly began to shift from a thing you played to a place you lived in. It was a great time to be a kid and a great time to love video games, as every year you would have new worlds to explore, new realities to live in, and a new pair of shoes to put yourself in. Now, it can't be overstated how important this was for video games. When I think about the difference between playing a game and watching a movie, again, the main difference is in the control. Open world games took this control that video games have to another level and allowed narratives to shine through while trusting the player with the pacing, the exploration, and ensuring that every single player who picked up the game had a unique experience. Open world games are some of the most magical and pure examples of what makes gaming so fun, and the industry was finally beginning to bloom. Now, though the 2000s were a fantastic, pivotal, and historic era for open world games, young Meraki, just a dumb baby at the time, had no idea what was about to come. 
Now don't get me wrong, I am a huge video game fan. You can see from my channel I'm a massive nerd. And I've gone back and played all the games that I've talked about because I am so interested in video game history, but also because I'm so set on providing a full and accurate experience of what playing these games was like. But for my personal childhood, and for many gamers worldwide of my generation, the best was about to come. And buckle up, because we are about to start moving fast. First, Notch dropped the old Minecraft mixtape in 2009, and it became to come to fruition in the early 2010s. Now, it's no secret that I'm a huge fan of this game. Open world totally took on a different definition with the introduction of procedural generation, a trend that we continue to see in the future in games like No Man's Sky a few years down the line. Minecraft, which some of you may have heard of, was able to take the scale of an open world to another level while still retaining the feeling of life thanks mostly in part to the emphasis on playing with your friends. And that's just the start, because up next we have a game that goes back in my head. My first big boy console was the Xbox 360, and I can still remember the magic of snow falling behind me in my living room in Vermont while I first got a glimpse of Tamriel on the family TV. I was absolutely dumbfounded. Bethesda had nailed the concept of a living, breathing open world at this point, and in my opinion, this was their magnum opus, the culmination of decades of hard work and practice. Skyrim was such an intricate game where exploration was truly awarded, where the plot, the subplot, and the sub-subplot all kept your eyes glued to the screen. A game where you could take characters' appearance, item build, choices, morality, and life into your own hands with near full control. The game is a masterclass in both environmental storytelling and in world building, and the result is one of the greatest games ever made. And made. And made. And made again. It's ENOUGH SLICES! Now a few years later, just when I needed something to truly rekindle my love for video games, The Witcher 3 released. While a very, very different game, this filled the void left by Skyrim, and I once again fell in love with a game and its world. The sheer scale of the world that The Witcher was able to make interesting and alive, paired with a beautiful, rich, and storied backdrop, and set to one of the greatest video game narratives I've ever experienced, make The Witcher my favorite single player game to this day. And of course, I would be remiss not to mention GTA V as well, a game that perfectly continued on the genre-defining series outlined by the previous GTA 3. In fact, GTA V was so good that the studio just decided to stop making the game. Now, what's beautiful about the latest generation of fantastic open world games is seeing their humble beginnings in games like The Legend of Zelda. I like to imagine that the developers of the Ocarina of Time see games like The Witcher and are proud, knowing that they directly paved the way for such a technical masterpiece. Because of their hard work, so many people, myself included, were able to have these unparalleled gaming experiences, where you truly immersed yourself and got lost in a world. In many ways, the release of Super Mario 64 in the 90s was the beginning of a developmental crescendo that would build over the next two decades. And these 21 years of building were about to come to an ultimate peak. In 2017, Breath of the Wild took everyone by surprise, taking every good system that has ever been implemented into an open world game, adding physics, intricate weather, and even chemistry elements, adding a crafting system that I actually liked, and above all, giving players true freedom. Just as Nintendo had hoped to do 21 years prior, Breath of the Wild fulfilled every kid's dream of having almost full mobility with almost no limitations. For years, the concept of you see that in the background, you can go there was just a marketing term, but many people treated that as the pinnacle of a good open world game. Breath of the Wild was the first game to truly deliver on that promise, and once again, I was dumbfounded by a video game. It was almost universally loved, sweeping awards shows, winning game of the year, and being praised for how revolutionary it was. Everything from the art design, to the world building, to the music, to the ambiance, to the gameplay, it was absolutely handcrafted with care and precision, not leaving a stone unturned. It's one of those transcendent games that no matter what age you are, has the ability to make you feel like a kid again. With smiles on their faces, people across the globe left the game optimistic, and excited, eager to see what the next game would be that would push the genre to the next level. But smiles would quickly fade. Later that year, just a few months after the earth-shattering release of Breath of the Wild, Ubisoft Montreal released Assassin's Creed Origins, a game that took the Assassin's Creed series to another level in terms of scale and story, adding RPG elements and emulating a lot of systems I really liked in other games. 
Now, I've actually played a lot of this game, the first new generation Assassin's Creed, and I had a blast. I was starting to believe that I was truly living in the golden age for open world games and that there was just going to be no end in sight. However, when I was playing the game, I mainly stuck to the main story, maybe because that's how I played previous Assassin's Creed games. But I didn't go off and explore as much as I typically would in an open world game. Now, I didn't put much thought to it at first. I thought it was just that I was really into the story, but I was kind of surprised that I was interested in Assassin's Creed plot with entirely new characters. Regardless, I was having fun, but in a few weeks, I started playing less and less, and eventually the game became another forgotten title in my Steam library. Now, I didn't put much thought into it, I went on and I played other games, but just one year later, the studio released another massive Assassin's Creed game, this time set in Rome. They tackled a whole new landscape, a whole new mythology, and a whole new story from the ground up in one year. Now, I was stoked. I love Rome and Roman history, so I immediately bought the game, and one week later, I had forgotten about it entirely. Now the cycle repeated itself a year later with a Viking version of the game. This time I held myself and I didn't open up my wallet to play the game. The Assassin's Creed series was starting to feel like it was made by a student who just discovered what Control c and Control v do, and I was having none of it. Now I knew something fishy was going on, so I threw on my detective hat and I started looking a bit deeper. These new Assassin's Creed games have done very well financially and have done respectfully well from a critical perspective as well. I started to think that maybe I was just salty that I was too lazy to finish two perfectly good games, wasting $120 in the process. Although looking at my Steam library, wasting money on games is one of my favorite hobbies. Some things still didn't feel right, so I dug deeper still. The new Assassin's Creed games are massive. They have character progression in the form of skill trees, they have armor and weapons with perks and stats. On the surface, it checks every box. But never has an open world experience felt so empty. When I play these games, I get drawn in with fond memories of Skyrim, Zelda, and The Witcher. I'm looking for another game to fill the void that that's left. The new Assassin's Creed games are designed to be advertised as filling that void. They fit the description, so I opened my wallet. But the spark, the charm, and the life of what makes the aforementioned games so rewarding to play is missing in these Assassin's Creed games. They're carefully crafted to emulate all these systems with Skyrim's skill trees, The Witcher's armor, and Zelda's open world, as well as a plethora of other copied systems. The games are churned out on a yearly basis that allows them to sculpt these massive worlds, but they don't have the time to dedicate the resources and proper care that fills these games with life. The result is a game that feels more like a chore than an experience. And guys, just ask my mom, I hate chores. Now don't get me wrong, in an era before Skyrim, Witcher, Zelda, these games would have all blown my mind. All things considered, they're good games and I can appreciate that they're trying to modernize the franchise. But it's so obvious that they're trying to replicate the open world formula without doing anything exceptionally well. Now I still thought that maybe I was being a bit harsh, so I sought out to see if other people felt the same way. After searching a bit more, I found this phenomenon that has started to infect video games over the past few years called open world fatigue. Essentially for a class of video games that inherently takes a lot of time to explore and immerse yourself in, a game that doesn't do it right, especially with the vast worlds and long stories that can be created more easily nowadays, a game that doesn't do it right leaves you feeling empty and exhausted. Funnily Funnily enough, a lot of people cited the new Assassin's Creed as one of the games that was one of the worst offenders, the game that caused them to realize that they were getting worn out on the genre. So yeah, I was right, and yes, the button you're looking for is right below the video, it's called the like button, it's next to the video, and don't talk about it anymore. But other games were causing these fatigue symptoms too. Games by developers we once loved, even games that had been received well and crafted with quite a bit of care like Red Dead had people feeling burned out. Like the world was too big, the story was too long, and the journey to get there was starting to feel like a chore rather than a game. Now reading all of this started to make me feel a bit sad, so I started to think about a solution. I decided two things are needed to fix this, both from us, the gamer boys, and from our friends, the publishers. First, from the developers, because this is a bit more straightforward. There is this terrible trend that pushes developers to make the biggest, longest games they can in hopes of enticing people with the proposal of a good return on their investment. Even if you're paying 60, even $70 for a game, you want to be at least getting 60 hours of gameplay, right? Forgotten then is the fact that scale without purpose is worse than having no scale in the first place. A game that feels empty or lifeless is going to immediately break immersion. The best times you have when playing video games are when you forget you're playing a game at all, and good open world games can capture that phenomenon perfectly. I found one key difference when comparing my experience with games like Witcher and Skyrim with the new Assassin's Creed games. For every area of those old games, I have memories of quests and people. Every single place I encountered was interesting, different, and had elements that I would be rewarded for exploring. Towns had some weird shit going on that they needed me for, dungeons were placed perfectly in a way that would both reward me with gear and a bit of knowledge. And the people, even if they weren't voice acted incredibly well, were memorable, not just a cookie-cutter citizen. Exploration was rewarded, not just sometimes, but always. 
I would estimate that I was never 15 seconds away from something interesting in games like Skyrim and The Witcher, and the result is a world that feels alive. Yes, modern developers can make these big, beautiful open worlds, but it has to pass this litmus test or else it's all for nothing. If the same care that had been put into the old games had been put into this new generation, they can earn that scale that they love to boast about. But like it or not, we can't blame all our problems on the developers. I hate to admit, but we, or at least I, am at least at fault too. It's like when you have a slice of cake and it tastes amazing, but then you eat an entire cake and not only have you ruined a six-year-old's birthday party, but you have a stomach ache as well. We learned how amazing open world games can be to the point where we keep buying them and keep trying to tackle this 80 hour world experience without realizing that we're setting ourselves up for a massive endeavor. These games can take months to finish and we don't have enough time to play every single one. So guys, stop buying every single open world game that comes out and looks exciting and pretty and new. You're setting yourself up for failure and you're incentivizing publishers to keep churning out games. On top of that, there are a plethora of fantastic games out there to experience. I am terrible at getting myself to play linear games like The Last of Us because I get so distracted by shiny open world games, but they're fantastic games that will not only make me more excited to return to the open world genre, but allow me to approach the next open world game with new context and a new appreciation. By branching out, you'll better understand what you like and don't like about video games and set yourself up for success rather than failure in the future. Now, even though there's been a somber downturn in the quality of open world games, we could be on the precipice of a new revolutionary open world game like Breath of the Wild that will shake up the industry. It's just important that we don't settle for less because as technology improves, the industry deserves progression. I'm beyond excited for what is to come because when open world games are done well, they're truly the most magical experiences I can think of. And I'm just patiently waiting for the next time that an open world games leaves my jaw wide open with the corners of my mouth trying their best not to make an embarrassing smile. Now I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. I know it's been a minute but I have some vague things planned including more frequent uploads. In the meantime I want you guys to let me know about your favorite open world experiences because I promise I'm gonna go through and read them all. Um, it really warms my heart and cheers me up to hear about that stuff. And also a huge shout out to all of you that stuck with me over this content drought, uh, especially my lovely patrons. I promise I'm gonna make it worth the wait. So stay tuned because a new video Video is probably coming next week, if not the week after. Until next time, this has been Meraki. Bye bye. Aww.